I think you know if you're sticking around by now that you're in for a treat. Um, I'm not sure where in the world you could go and get sharper insight into the global energy challenge than this room with the six people who are gonna be up here over the next 90 minutes. Um, together, they're studying technologies in their labs that have the potential to change the global energy system. They're serving in government positions that are setting policies that are extraordinarily relevant to what gets funded and what gets worked on. Um, they are on boards of companies that are some of the hottest names in this area. And they are teaching many of you in this room and the next generation of people who are gonna decide how all this turns out. So um, here's what we're gonna try to do today. We're gonna try to get beyond a group hug. We're gonna try to get beyond kind of gauzy agreement that everyone endorses the nirvana of a low carbon energy system like they endorse motherhood and apple pie. And we're gonna try to get into a sharp discussion of the hard questions about why we're not there yet and how we get there. Um, what would a low carbon energy system that really is economically possible look like? Why aren't we there yet? Why aren't we moving there faster than we are? And how might we change things? You are gonna be a big part of this discussion. Um, Richard told you how to use your app. Uh, you're gonna use it at various points today, so uh, keep your trigger figure ready. Um, we're gonna come back to a couple of questions for you in a moment. Uh, I'm gonna introduce these folks really quickly and then I'm gonna take a couple of minutes to kind of frame an issue, these issues and then we'll come back and get into a discussion. So uh, Nate Lewis to my immediate left. Uh, you, uh, by the way, I'm not gonna do long bios. You all have these bios I'm assuming in your books but I'm gonna give you the relevant portion uh, at least from where I sit. Nate Lewis um, studies electronic noses. That's kind of all you need to know. Um, Arun Majumdar um, was the founding director of ARPA-E uh, which many of you I think know in this room, but, um, but has been an extraordinarily interesting um, and kind of uh, counterinsurgent government agency in terms of trying to get around certain bureaucracies and getting technologies to market. Um, and uh, more recently uh, was appointed as a science envoy dealing with energy and the environment to Poland and the Baltics. So perhaps more about that later. Nancy Fund is uh, founder uh, of DBL Partners, a venture capital firm which has been investing in this space for many years. Um, and she sits on the boards of companies including SolarCity and Tesla. Um, which I think- I don't sit on the board of Tesla. <laughs> oh, you sit on the board of SolarCity. Yeah, and, yeah. And I, was, I was a board observer uh, and an, and an early, our firm was an early investor in Tesla. I'm, and I'm just clearing the record just because we have a slightly yes, sensitive merger. Yes, because that's a relevant point. Thank merger. you, thank you. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me, we're gonna come back to these three in a second, but I wanna just do three things really quickly. I wanna, I wanna sort of frame things. The first point I wanna make is that we are living, all of us, in an age of energy abundance. Coal, oil, and natural gas are at what by historic standards are uh, lows in terms of prices. In fact, uh, you may have seen this yesterday, the federal government came out with the news that US gasoline consumption in June reached an all-time high, um, higher than the last high, which was in July 2007. I dare say that's probably a result of where oil prices are these days. Um, renewable energy prices are falling a lot faster than most people expected too. Um, two, two firsts, according to the International Energy Agency in 2015, more than half of all the electrical generating capacity that was added in the world was renewable capacity. Now to be clear for the wonks in the room, that's capacity, not actual generation. Uh, and secondly, in 2015, the cumulative installed capacity of renewables exceeded the cumulative installed cap capacity of coal-fired generation around the world. A fairly significant development. And lastly, in May, across the world in Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates, there was an auction for a solar project, which if built as planned would be perhaps the largest solar project in the world. And the bid was three cents per kilowatt hour for that energy, which is extraordinarily low. So um, we are in a, a new era, I think it's fair to say, in terms of renewables, again, which we'll talk about more. All right, point number two. So this is great, lots of energy, lots of clean energy. How are we doing in terms of reducing carbon emissions? So on the one hand, there, there are some encouraging signs. China and the United States have both pledged new commitments to reduce their carbon emissions over the next 25 or so years. Um, in 2015, for the second straight year, global GDP grew 3% and global CO2 emissions were flat. That suggests the possibility of a, of a decoupling of economic growth from CO2 emissions, at least to the extent that that has been coupled essentially since the start of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and that 
same statistic happened roughly in the United States as well. Okay, great, but not good enough. Why not good enough? Couple of points of, of data. In Germany in 2015, renewable energy accounted for 30% of electricity generation, 30%, and yet CO2 emissions in Germany still rose 1%. Cumulatively, there was something called the Paris Climate Conference uh, last December, which I think many of you are aware of, and there were a bunch of pledges by a bunch of countries, that's the technical term, and those pledges, <laughs> according to the International Energy Agency, uh, add up to uh, an expectation from the IEA that renewable energy will constitute 28% of electricity by 2021, up five percentage points from where we are today. And yet, that's not enough to get the world on track to reduce, to keep CO2 emissions uh, from getting to a point in the atmosphere, uh, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere from getting to a point that they push global uh, average temperatures up, up, up above two degrees. So uh, more than ever before and still not enough. Okay, last point I wanna make. What does the public think about all this? Um, there's some really interesting, to my mind, polling done by the Pew Research Center every year. And in fact, Pew came out recently with a new set of polling and I'm not gonna, I, I, I recommend the whole set of polls to you if you're interested in global attitudes toward climate change, but let me just give you a couple of quick points. Um, this is American adults. This was a poll conducted earlier this year. Um, what percentage of Americans think that human activity is causing climate change? 47%. 31% think that natural causes are causing climate change. Okay, and then there are just two more points I wanna tell you, which to my mind, five days before an election are pretty interesting in terms, of, in terms of the extent of partisan division in this country on views on these issues. So um, what is the Democrat-Republican split in terms of the percent of Americans who say that the earth is warming mostly because of human activity? Neither of these are gonna surprise you. The Democrats, 69% of Democrats say that it's, it's human activity. 23% of Republicans say it's human activity. Um, I wanna just give you one last bit, and this is, to my mind, really interesting. So, so um, these are um, percentages of Americans who believe that the United States should actively ramp up certain forms of energy. So I'm gonna give you first the national, well, I'm gonna give you the national split and the Democratic-Republican split for a couple of them. Solar, 89% of Americans say the United States should ramp up more solar. And really interestingly, it seems to me, there's not a huge uh, partisan split on that point. 83% of conservative Republicans, 97% of liberal Democrats agree that on solar. Now I'm oversimplifying, I'm eliding a lot of the details here. Let's go to nuclear. 43% of Americans um, think that the, the United States should push harder in nuclear. 57% of conservative Republicans, 40% of liberal Democrats. Coal mining. 41% of Americans say the United States should push harder. 73% of conservative Republicans, 14% of liberal Democrats. Okay, I'm not trying to prove anything here, I just want you to kind of get a sense of where the landscape is. So, um, let us do this. Let you weigh in, so grab your phones, and we're gonna go through a couple of quick questions. Do we have them on the screen? The first question is, They're right in front of you. Oh, no, we're not talking about computers and phones and tablets this time. We're gonna cue the first question. Let's see, well, I'll read the question and you guys can vote and then we'll, maybe we'll see it on the screen. I have seen with my own eyes what I believe to be the effects of climate change. I have seen with my own eyes. That's gonna happen, that's, that's next. Yes, no, A, yes, B, no. I have seen with my own, I'm sorry? Yeah, I have seen with my own eyes what I believe to be the effects of climate change. Okay. Should we go on to the next one? I'm not sure how long this takes. Wow. wow. Boy, I would, well, perhaps we'll have some questions about that. That's fascinating. <laughs> okay, number two, renewable sources other than hydropower, other than hydropower and other than biomass, today provide about 1% of global energy. In 2030, they will provide 1%, 5%, 10%, or more than 15%. What do you guys think while we're waiting? 
you're going to look and see what they think. <laughs> no, I'm interested to see what they think. God. Okay. That's about right. Anyway. Oh, that's okay. Sorry. Last question, and then we're going to jump into these folks. Um, yeah. Was it not up there? Yeah, yeah, we did. We, you want to put it back up? I mean, it was 10% was the, was the winner. 10 and 15. Yeah. Okay. Last question before we dig in. The global energy system will be transformed into one that emits no carbon on a net basis. The global energy system will be transformed into one that emits no net carbon in, there's a D here, 2025, 2050, 2075. Do we have a D? D is in your dreams. <laughs> Uh, so I guess I'll tell you, let's, since we don't, I actually, D is not a joke. If you think it's never going to happen, then don't vote. Well, and then we'll do no, hands no, at the I end or something. We'll do, we'll do hands at the end, because I don't know how else to do it, but I think it's an important question. So A, B, or C, and if it's neither, if it's neither and you don't think it's ever going to happen, don't vote and raise your hand at the end, and we'll just sort of wing it. Let's go. And who didn't vote? Okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so not a lot of expectation that it happens in the next 50 years at least. All right, good. All right. Um, Can't do math. Hmm? 50 is about right. 50 and uh, 16 is 66. 2070. Well, it's almost there. Okay. All right, so let's go, jump in. So, Nate, um, talk, about, talk about low carbon fuels and your sense of the goal here is to have you each kind of frame. Um, the extent to which you think a particular approach is actually going to make a difference. So um, I will tell you that as an outside observer, I used to hear a lot of discussion about hydrogen, for instance, and I don't hear a lot of discussion about hydrogen these days. I hear increasing discussion about the potential to turn, for instance, solar energy into a liquid fuel. Um, tell us kind of what's going on and where we are. Great. That's exactly the last thing is what I do with my research, and in part that was a GSEP started project. Uh, but I'm going to divert it a little bit into the broader issue. Uh, the broader issue is we've got plenty of ways now to make renewable electricity, solar and wind, and solar and wind combined with transmission and potentially um, some small amount of storage. We don't have very many ways to make renewable energy dense liquid fuels. Biofuels are the only option right now, and they may or may not make it in the end, and I wouldn't want to bet our planet solely on that coming through. Uh, at the same time, we don't have any other than pumped hydro credible way of massive grid scale storage to compensate for the intermittency of renewables, which will be a showstopper against getting to a full clean energy system unless we come up with that technology. Uh, we can't do much, I think, as R&D people on lowering the cost of solar panels much now because it's mostly the balance of systems. The active modules are only 30% of the installed cost. Soon it will cost more to ship panels from China than it will be to make the panels in the first place because they're heavy. Uh, so that's all going to come from balance of systems and integration. Uh, the missing gap that we don't have is the ability to convert clean electrons into clean fuel molecules. That's the key to making this all add up. Now, there are three biogeochemical cycles that can sustain energy on our planet, a carbon cycle, a nitrogen cycle, and a water cycle. Once you inject power into any one of those gears, you can run all the others. If I make hydrogen, I can make natural gas. I can make ammonia. If I have natural gas, I can make hydrogen. I can make ammonia. That's what we do now. If I had ammonia, I could make the others. So the key isn't to argue about which fuel is your energy carrier. We should be letting the marketplace figure that out. The key is somehow making a fuel to satisfy these two gaps, massive grid scale storage and high energy density transportation fuels that we don't have credible technical options for now. So if you ask what the R&D agenda should be that could have the most impact in perturbing the path that we're on otherwise, I would say it's converting clean electrons into clean molecules because the chemical industry knows how to take molecules and make other molecules. We know how to take electricity into electricity, but we don't have capability to convert to bridge the stationary and mobility transportation sectors. It also lets you unify your assets much more 
because instead of curtailing a nuclear power plant, you should be making hydrogen by electrolysis during those periods to, to find a way to store and use it. There are lots of virtues in doing this, and it's where R&D can have a huge lever in changing the outcomes from where we are now. Okay, so I'm going to resist my inclination to ask you about six questions about what you just said, and we'll come back to that in That's a moment. Right. Okay, so Arun, um, talk about the grid and yeah. talk a little bit about this pro program that's going on at Stanford, but, but more broadly, um, I constantly hear people say renewable energy might save the world if there's storage and if there's a smarter grid. And right. so let's go below the buzzwords of storage and a smarter grid and talk about what that means. The only thing I would add to what Nate said is that he's exactly right except that whatever R&D has to scale in volume and cost so that it's competitive in the marketplace compared to you know, uh, fossil fuel. And that's the real hard part. Okay. That's the real one. Competitive economically. Okay. Economically and at scale. The okay. volume yep. that you need is, is really, really high. So on the grid side, look, uh, the grid has been around for about 120 years. And it was designed for integrating um, lots of loads at, the, at one end of the grid and some thermal power plants um, at, at different parts of the grid as well. And these are large centralized thermal power plants, which, um, and it was centralized because it was cheaper that way. And, uh, and so that's, and it's been around for the last 100, you know, 120 years. Now what is happening is that renewables um, are getting cheaper the cost of electricity generation is getting cheaper. And you pointed out the numbers, three cents a kilowatt hour, unsubsidized power purchase agreements have been signed in, a world, in many parts of the world, which is fantastic. But they also come with volatility. And the volatility can be managed at small amount of penetration, which is, you know, California is about 20, 25% or so, and can manage. But what is that? Percent of the to of total electricity generation. That's right. That's right. And if you, so if you, the goal is to really decarbonize the grid. And you could decarbonize it by increasing nuclear. You could decarbonize by integrating more uh, renewables like solar and wind. Uh, you could decarbonize by carbon capture and, and store that. Or you could sort of reduce the load, if you may, right? So there are all these ways. It turns out, at least right now, solar and wind turns out to be a really cheap way to do it in terms of electricity generation, except if you go to high penetration, the grid was never designed for it. So you gotta adapt the grid, okay? So you got volatility on one side, which is utility scale solar and wind. And as I said, you can manage that within about 25%. If you go beyond 50, 60, 70%, as, as was suggested, then you gotta really change the grid. So how do you do that? Well, maybe you can add storage. Well, storage costs money. How much storage? Um, it turns out that you're gonna have large ramps when the sun goes down and people go home, you will suddenly get a huge ramp of load. So now you need ramping services. What would you do? Well, natural gas plants, you could do that. That costs money and that has carbon emissions. You, maybe you could curtail the load or control the load. Or maybe the sun is shining somewhere in California and they need the electricity somewhere in the east. The point is that you need a much more elegant grid than the grid that's that we right. now have today. That's right. So yeah. you, need a, you need high voltage DC transmission. That could help a lot. Uh, from where the wind is generated, which is in the Midwest, and to where the load centers are, which is in the east and the west. Uh, US will be very well served if you had a high voltage DC backbone. Uh, we don't quite have, we have some, we don't have enough. Um, China is building that right now. So, uh, so there are lots of options, and what's the most cost effective options given the jurisdictional boundaries that we have and all within the United States? We don't, no one really has the right answer for that. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Yeah. So Nancy, um, let's, this is another issue where we could talk for an hour, like each of these issues, just about clean energy investing, but let me, let me try not to, be, to put too fine a point on it. Um, it seems to me one of the most striking realities of the, 20, 20, of, the, of the area within a 20 mile radius of where we're sitting is what has happened to clean energy investing um, over the last five years, um, where or maybe 10 years, where I think it's fair to say there was kind of euphoria about the possibility before, and a lot of people lost a lot of money. Um, and so what I wonder is, what didn't happen that people thought 
would happen? And to what extent aren't people now learning from that lesson and doing something differently? Because there are a lot of people, unlike you, who are no longer in the game. Well, uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, there are cycles in our business in venture capital. And in 2000, everyone lost a whole lot of money in the internet. Uh, and a lot of people don't remember that or they ha they're in denial about it, but uh, <laughs> I lived through it. I'm sure many of you did. It, it wasn't pretty. And in, in some ways, the rush to invest in clean tech was a response to that. That's what a lot of people don't understand is that a lot of people that came into clean tech were, were refugees mm -hmm. from the dot-com bust. And you know, no one would invest in, in the dot-com uh, companies uh, in that post-2000 period for several years. And returns were, were awful. Um, so this notion that clean tech is somehow the only sector that's ever had losses is just ridiculous. And let's, let's be rigorous. We're here at Stanford. Let's understand that there are cycles to this business. So what happened is that when, the, when everyone and their brother came into clean tech because they couldn't make money in, in internet at the moment and they needed a new thing, and that's another part of our business. There's always a new thing. Uh, food waste is a new thing right now. So uh, that's not unique to, to clean tech either. Uh, but so what happened is that they realized, wow, this is different. This isn't like um, investing in the inter internet. There's this policy, and not only is there policy, it's like 50 times policy, because it's all at the state level, except for things like the ITC or the PTC. And so while, while a lot of healthcare investors go through that, again, clean tech's not the only field that has a regulatory burden on it. We, we all understand that there's an FDA out, FDA out there that prohibits us from uh, making money in every single biotech deal we might invest in. So again, not, clean tech is, is not different in that sense. However, it, it's more embryonic. It's, it's earlier. And we also have, as, as has been mentioned, we have an industry that it's kind of like uh, the, the fairy tale. I mean, it's been asleep for 120 years. And, and no one has paid attention to it except people that work in that field. No one talk, talked about energy at cocktail parties that I, I ever went to until you know, maybe five or six years ago because of things like Tesla and it getting kind of sexy. So um, basically, that there were a lot of tourists in that weren't really schooled in it. And that was also a, a time, as Arun well knows, that the field became politicized. And mm -hmm. it, it became, you know, the, that whole Solyndra era and the, the hearings on Capitol Hill. While, while kind of people were busy at work in the states, in Washington it became, you know, political theater and very damaging. And so, and then tech became strong again. And so, uh, faced with the opportunity to get back into something that was familiar and that people had made money on, even though they lost their many people lost their shirts in, in the 2000 era, uh, a lot of people went back back to that, and God love them. But so now, what we have today, while it is smaller, it's smarter. It's it's experienced. It's committed. It understands. Uh, you know, that you need capital, you need innovation, and you need policy, and you navigate your way through that. You also have more corporates coming in, much more international investing, a lot of family offices driven by uh, feeling that they need to do something about the most important challenge of our age. Who, who are prepared to spend much larger sums than the average venture, cap venture capital firm has been prepared or is designed to spend. I mean, many of them, right. yeah, are. I mean, right. it's a range. Um, and then some of them just put money in funds like ours and say, this is something that's important to us. We want to make money, but we also want to, you know, we don't want to invest in the next dog walking app. <laughs> okay. So we have 17 minutes left. And Which here's what we're going to do for part of that 17 <laughs> minutes. So you guys are not in a room with an audience of people. You're sitting around a conference table and you're trying to figure out what deal you're going to do. And that is you're trying to design something that is effective in terms of moving the grid in a way that Arun is describing the grid needs to be moved and that enables electrons to be turned into fuel in a way that Nate is describing needs to be done, a way that at least is in part is relevant to the redesign of the grid and something that Nancy and her um, limited partners uh, are not gonna laugh out of the room as being pie in the sky, something they're gonna want to invest with. So go. I already have such an investment. Yeah. 
but I'll let What's you What's your investment? Uh, it's Advanced Microgrid Solutions. It's, it's uh, bringing together storage, demand response, uh, renewables, uh, and allowing you to reshape your load by virtue of price signals and grid strength. So just peel that back a second and, and walk us through what is, an, what is a microgrid? Well, old style microgrids were just redundant. You know, you know, universities had generators in order to keep the, the power on when, when the, the lines went down. Little mini grids. Yeah, but today it's totally different. It's, it, can be, it could be islanded or it can be connected to the grid. But what it does is it says, okay, we have a certain load and that's, we're gonna define our, our generation based on that load and based on uh, what's, you know, if, if, if it's 100 degrees out and everyone's got their air conditioners on, a microgrid in, implemented in a building or a, an office park or a university would say, okay, don't pull your power from the grid right now. It's expensive, the grid is under stress, and that take it from your rooftop or take it from your, your uh, batteries. And also, by the way, manage your load down a few notches and do that in real time and get paid for it because price signals are working in your favor. And, and that you become sort of a virtual power plant and you are able to um, really control your own destiny in a, in a much more sophisticated way. Okay, you, you're both shaking your head, so one of, one of so you. So what I'm concerned job. about is I think the same thing Arun's concerned about. The, the fact that at the margins you can do something by demand management and you might even 25%. Just define demand management. That t price signals that it, you that shouldn't be using. Use less. People use it at different times, right. not necessarily okay. less. Just shift when you turn on your air conditioner or wash your clothes or turn on your pool pump. Uh, that's fine, but that, it's the gigawatt days when the wind doesn't blow and the summer doldrums and the nights when the sun isn't shining that if you've got deep penetration of intermittent renewables, you can't shut down the US. So what do you do to meet reliability in those scenarios that are that 2075, 80% people thought we'd get to this clean energy system? You can't get there unless you have a way to do massive grid scale storage to compensate for these massive swings that the natural resources have inherent with them. So how do you do that? Uh, if you think about batteries, let's think about batteries and storage. We'll put every 150 million electric vehicles are gonna be fully electrified. So all the batteries in the world for the next 50 years go into that. We have everybody vehicle to grid plugged in. Plug their electric cars in. Yeah, everybody does that, all 150 million. Uh, that'll power the United States in one of these whiteout, blackout days for less than one hour. 150 million fully electric vehicles powers the U.S. for less than an hour. Okay, so this shows you the challenge of what it means to really do massive grid scale storage in a full energy system. Um, I think that's the problem that R&D has to capture. That's, that's really, it's the molecules from electrons, it's disruptive ways of storage, it's, it's what do you do for the two weeks and seasons uh, that you have or more when you just don't have enough wind and sun to make up the difference any other way except store that energy somehow that we now store in the bonds of fossil fuels. So we've gotta figure out how to do that because well, we can go around the margins. That's what people are doing. Hawaii has the highest penetration in the country. They're doing exactly that. Uh, SoCal Edison is spend, you know, has 90 megawatts of, of microgrid storage and, and is wrestling with the closure of San Onofre and the, the capping of the methane leaks in Aliso Canyon. We are dealing with these problems real time and we're solving them. Arun, do you want to, I have a question, but you were jumping in, Wait. so you jumped in. I would you say, you know, talk about investment. I would, I would invest in Stanford. <laughs> just because really said, that's, that's, without, just without bias, right? You can include a few <laughs> other places, come on. <laughs> okay, Caltech. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's what they call psychic, that psychic return. <laughs> yeah. Forget about those East Coast um, institutions. Yeah, but on a more them. serious note, um, look, the cheapest way to store Storage is gonna be important. Um, there's no question if you do deep penetration. Um, the cheapest way to store electricity is pumped hydro. Exactly. There are lots of hydro plants. A small fraction have been retrofitted to do pumped. 
And just again, and just so that we're all defining terms here, you want to explain in, in 10 seconds what yeah, it's just is. you know you have a dam, you you got you got water flowing down, you generate electricity, you can use that as a pump, and you, you use the pump to push up, the back and then, water right. back, and then you know Great. Okay. it's not the highest energy density, uh, you know, but nevertheless, at the end of the day, it's cost. Mm -hmm. And um, I would first look at where the pumped hydro, uh, where the potential pumped hydro, um, and see what we could do to retrofit. Uh, the existing you know, hydropower to do pumped hydro, if you can, right? I think that would be terrific. But if you want to do that, you also need to look at, and you know, one of the challenges that the renewables industry is going to have in the future is transmission lines. And we need to figure out in this country. And just to be clear, that's largely because the parts of the country where, where the renewable resources are right. greatest are not the parts of the country where right. uh, I mean, population the population is largest. That's right. The best right. wind resources are in the middle of the country, Midwest and all. People don't quite live there, right? So, and, um, and is, and but is you getting, can balance. I mean, you that's why balance. we're talking you, about you, you moving beyond the Cal ISO to a Western ISO. That's right. So you could, you know, there are domains uh, in the Cal ISO, then you get Midwest ISO. Um, and these are, these are effectively regional grids within the United States. That's right. We're the about, right? Balancing authorities. I mean, there's a right. big movement yeah. afoot to go beyond California to include right. the West right. so that you solve right. the problem so that you're you just mentioned. Because yeah. there's, there's wind coming in from Wyoming. There's sun here. And right. you can make all and of is that this, And is, 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 this mostly a is this mostly a political problem or is this mostly a technological problem? I don't think it's yeah. a... Well, technology can get cheaper. I don't think it's a technology problem. It's so, a, what is uh, it here's my thinking that I think we should have as a country. Just like in t when you went from telephone lines, you, we created a backbone of optical fiber. That's the trunk line, so most of the data is flowing. We need a, in a long term, another high voltage DC backbone in this country so that you could then transmit electricity exactly, as Nancy was saying, where the loads are, you can balance things out. Not to say you don't need storage. You do need storage as well. Mm -hmm. You need the options. And how you optimize that to reduce the cost depends on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And we cannot sit here and say, this is the answer. I don't think anyone can say that. So we need options for that. The challenge with high voltage D or any transmission line is the whole permitting process is long. And that requires, you know, so for example, if it goes from from state A crosses state B to state C, we need to figure out how to compensate state B in the middle if the electricity is going from state A to state C. We don't have a formula for that. And do you, and, so, and, and this is a question for all of you because I think it's an important question about the political realities here. Do you think that the forces interested in a change along the lines of what Arun is talking about are more powerful or less powerful than whatever forces are not? Or, or is that a, is that a, is that a improperly construed question? Is there a general agreement that what Arun is talking about is indeed the way forward and we're all one happy family and we want to go forth together? Hmm. I think this is a tough, it's a tough question, question because it involves policy and also the interplay between uh, short term profitability and doing the best thing for the most economical and efficient use of resources over continental scales over the long term. And those are not the same things. You could make investments to make optimal microgrids or wind installations where there's high peak power and you can get a lot of return at that one site uh, and get the production tax credits. But that's not the same thing as saying I really need to take less sites but that are less correlated so I can smooth that out with the high voltage transmission line and have more reliability. So what's good for us all in the long term is not necessarily what's good for many of us in the short term. Well, that's a really but, interesting, but go ahead, Nancy. I think yeah. the, the political sentiment is shifting. Maybe it's imperceptible, imperceptible to, to, to most people, but I, I'm on the board of the Bill Lane Center here, and we have Western governors come every, every fall, and, and the Montana, and Wyoming, and Utah, and there's always this tension between those states and California, and, 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 and is it right to, to send our wind to you guys and how are you going to pay us? That has shifted. I mean, is it right to send their wind to California? 
Well, yeah. They want right. to sell. Yeah. yeah. They want to sell. Of course, yeah. they want but to then sell. all of the transmission issues and the compensation, it used to, they used to just throw up their hands and say, we'll dig more coal. Now that's not an option. Yeah. And so now people are actually getting to the table and we're having some really important discussions. And in California, there's, there's, there are legislators that are dedicating huge amounts of their time to help trying to make this happen. Will it work now? I mean, I don't know what the odds are, but for the first time, you're, you're getting people engaged in this discussion in a serious way. I would say Nancy is exactly right. I mean, you, you, you do need leadership in this. You do need the leadership of various states to come together and say, you know, let's work this out. Let's align the incentives. Right. And, and that requires some compromise here and there. You know, just to say that if you get cheap wind from somewhere, uh, you know, Utah, for example, and want to sell it out here, some local generators may say, oh, my God, I'm going to go out of business. Right. Well, they're going to push back. So there's some... There are issues to let's deal just with. Be, just to be, let's just be, be impolite for a minute. I mean, yeah. let's just sketch out what are the, what are the um, contradictory policies oh, that, that, that sit on the books. Sorry? What are the contradictory policies as they are now? So either of anyone. Let me, so I think the number was last May, over 20% of the hours in California, the price of electricity was negative. Well, that's obviously a contradictory policy example. And... People are and the price was negative because there is cause. There's a production well, tax credit, for instance, on wind. Storage. And so uh, the producers get paid to produce electricity, and they can arbitrage half of what they make to sell into a market when other people have to pay them to sell that wind. And what that does is it disincentivizes the nuclear power people because they don't have that. They have to curtail, right. and now they're inefficiently utilizing that asset. And this is the reason why a lot of the nuclear power plants are going to be shut down because of these counter incentives that we've got on, on one form of low carbon energy versus another uh, that in the big picture, um, you could argue, are contradictory and probably not optimal and may not even make sense. So just to be right. very simple, simple about it, I mean, policies you're saying are, are, are angled perhaps because of a bit of lobbying for some people to make money in a way that's not beneficial to the whole system. Right? What, well, what a shocker. If we're talking, right? about, yeah. the, if yeah. we're talking about the unlevel playing field, I mean, and again, check our website, check, read any paper, the, the level of subsidization of the fossil industry uh, you know, dwarfs any other. You've done incentive. really, really interesting work on this. So this yeah. question always comes up in any discussion about energy. Yeah. So take, take a not, little bit. But, you know, it's not even controversial anymore. When we wrote it, it was controversial. But now, you know, uh, Vogue you magazine found, you found, writes about You found them. what? You found what quickly? Just that in the early days of energy sources that, that uh, in the early part of the 20th century for oil and gas and the mid 20th century for nuclear, the level of government support through tax policies, through uh, the, the Price-Anderson Act, that uh, was, was five and 10 times greater than the incentives we applied to the first 15 years of renewables. And, and to be clear, the Price-Anderson Act is federal law that protects effectively nuclear generators from the obligation to cover the yeah. full cost and, and, of... you know, yeah. no judgment here. They, they worked, and, and they, were, they were great for their time because we got cheap energy. We didn't know about global warming but, in, in the early But your point century. is that the, relevant, the, 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 the comparison of the subsidies is what? Is, is the, the, if you listen to certain politicians talk, you'd think that it was the, it was the reverse, that, su that clean energy was being subsidized at, at levels way higher than oil and gas and... And, uh, so I'll give you one example, and Dan Riker knows this very well, and we actually pushed that when we were in DOE. There's something called, in financing, project finance, there's something called master limited partnerships. And this is essentially a tax policy which reduces the tax burden to create an infrastructure. And that reduces the cost of capital, and cost of capital is a big deal. It's heavily used it, by it's, the oil and gas industry and pipeline. No, 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 let me explain. Okay. This law was made in 1982, and by law, it can only be used for oil and gas and coal. It cannot be used for renewable, yeah. for infrastructure. Yeah. So now there's an MLP Parity Act to, in, to bring parity on all of the above on the hill right now. It's been there for a while. Yeah, it has, no one has on really acted on it. Years. Now that would bring, so the, talk about you know, subsidies. This is a form of subsidy, right? And I only think that it is in that one, the Parity Act does not have nuclear. And I've been telling 
the people on the hill that they need to include right. nuclear in it because everything should have equal footing when you're talking about energy right. and let them play, right? Or the alternative is just to put a price on carbon and get rid of everyone's subsidies. Okay, okay so let me just interrupt. So we have two minutes left and we're throwing <laughs> Actually, out Actually, I disagree with that. I'll, I'll come to it, that. Okay, well, so we, two we have, <laughs> we're not gonna get through all this, but we'll, everyone's gonna come up at the end and we'll have some more time to talk. But I want us to, try, I want to focus this on political reality. So Nancy, you posited that, that the ship is turning somewhat, that there's a change kind of broadly in opinion. And Nate and, and Arun gave us examples of what in their view are still um, uh, unequal re realities of right. policy. So wh what, is the, what, is the what is the likelihood that something fundamental happens that actually gets this country where you huh. all think it should happen in a minute and 30 seconds? And, well, and really I, quickly, do you think actually that what happens next week in the election really matters I think to, the, matters to the answer to this question? It happens a lot because the two divergent energy paths, I mean, Hillary Clinton wants us to be a, a clean energy superpower uh, and, and Donald Trump is, is saying that it's a it's a plot that the Chinese are creating, and I'm I'm just mimicking what I'm hearing. Okay, so yeah, so what so, the, so but, what, what 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 actually happens then in in the real world? What do well, you think? Well, I think is the policies happen? and the people that you hire for jobs like Arun ha had, and I mean they're completely different, and and so elections matter. I mean that that's important. I also think that going on here uh, with the elections. Um, even more interesting for our world is looking at Florida and Nevada and Washington. For the first time, you have ballot initiatives in Washington, it's a carbon price. In Nevada, it's the casinos uh, wanting, getting a vote to leave Nevada Energy and develop their own uh, policy, uh, their own energy uh, systems. And in Florida, it's this uh, yes, no, uh, the utility is saying they're pro-solar, and yet when you actually vote for it, it's it's a vote against rooftop solar. The fact that the in Florida is the, the third largest state. This is not Nevada, where three three million people live. This is like 18 or 19 million people. So this is big, and Washington's big because it's never happened before. These, when the history is written, this will be noted that wow, this went from being in public utilities commissions and arcane journals and and and. Um, kind of classrooms to being uh, a popular vote. And really quickly, Nate and Arun, are, are you both as sanguine that um, to the extent that there's a turning of the ship, that that is, ship's going to turn in a way that actually is going to make the kind of, the kind of environmental difference mm. at, at economically realistic cost that you, you presumably hope will happen? Well, I mean, I, first of all, I think a carbon price on Capitol Hill will need a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And that requires time. Mm -hmm. It's, it's and, been a lot of long time thus far, yeah. right? I mean, there's mm -hmm. been a So the way it is right now, and the way, mm -hmm. and this election really matters. Um, but I think I, I agree with Nancy. Look at what's going on in Washington, mm -hmm. the state of Washington, which is, I think, a revenue neutral carbon tax, which mm -hmm. is, yeah. it would be a really good measure to have and to see you know, how that works out. I hope it passes, uh, but we don't know. And there have been strange bedfellows that have yeah. paired up in either promoting it or opposing it. And I think that's an interesting yeah, it's, case study it's in itself. So there are pre two pretty rosy outlooks, Nate. Yeah. Are you that rosy? I'm, 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 I didn't say I was rosy. <laughs> I I'm said pessimistic, it's a lot of but you're, but you're, you're optimistic that things are changing and that things actually have chances. I, things are changing. How fast it changes, it's hard to say. Right. It's hard to say. I, I'm pessimistic and optimistic in different lenses. I'm pessimistic given the track record of the ability of governments to respond to have the long-term planning view that is needed to get this transition done by policy. I'm optimistic, just like I heard Bill Gates be incredibly optimistic about the ability of technology to help us get better options, to help us solve this by making clean energy the cheapest energy, then we're gonna not gonna need policy, it's gonna be economics and everybody's gonna do it. And so I think if you turn loose technology and let us invent ways out of the mess we made, uh, that that's the way we're gonna get it done. We're not gonna get it done uh, by relying on the government long-term policy to get it right. Okay, so that's a fascinating point that we have no time to talk about, but I would recommend, <laughs> I would recommend that that would be an interesting thing to throw back at these folks in a question in a little bit. So, get off the stage, thank you very much. Okay. Um, we were that bad. <laughs> So
so um, next, thank you. You're gonna come back in we three minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, that was great. Um, so uh, Sally Benson, Bert Richter, and Jim Sweeney are gonna come up. And the, um, the notion of dividing the panel this way was that the three folks up here uh, represent sort of disruptive uh, possibilities for the future. And what we're gonna hear now is a discussion um, about uh, more, and these folks may take issue with what I'm about to say, but more iterative changes to sources of energy and uses of energy that have been around for a while. Yeah, um, assigned chairs? You may Where sit wherever you'd like, wherever you'd like. Well, since I'm a middle talker, I'll sit in the middle. Excellent. Sal, you wanna sit here? Sure. Okay. And Jim, you wanna sit next to Bert? So um, we're gonna jump right into this. So um, again, uh, these folks um, all are Stanford folks and I suspect need no introduction to you, but I'm gonna give just the quickest of introductions. Um, Sally um, wears many hats at Stanford, um, but um, interestingly to my mind is an expert on carbon capture and storage of technology about which much has been said and um, there are some in the world who argue that nothing that we've talked about is gonna really get the world anywhere unless that technology works. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. Um, Bert Richter um, has been working in the nuclear field for a long, long time. Wrote a, a book called Beyond Smoke and Mirrors and in my experience is No Shrinking Violet. Um, so I think we will have an interesting discussion. Um, and Jim Sweeney um, uh, has been spending a lot of time working on uh, the issue of energy efficiency and has really, really interesting um, a really interesting reality check, I think, about the relative importance of energy efficiency versus a lot of the things that we've been talking today, um, the, the importance of the unsexy stuff versus the sexy stuff. Um, uh, Jim has a new book out called Energy Efficiency, Building a Clean and Secure Economy, published by Hoover, um, which you are able to buy. Okay, so um, why don't each of you take a couple of minutes and talk about just those things. So, um, Sally, against the backdrop of all of the discussion that we've had about renewables and a grid that enables renewables, um, I, will, I will spare the statistics, but the reality is that our world is overwhelmingly powered by fossil fuel, and most people expect that that will continue to be the case. So talk about the notion of burning fossil fuel in a way that's less mm -hmm. uh, problematic to the environment. Okay. Uh, I rarely get part of the more of the same conversation. So anyway, thanks for characterizing <laughs> us as that. Uh, so, so broadly what I want to speak about is perhaps a controversial idea that the oil and gas industry has a role to play in deep decarbonization of the global energy system. And I think that starts with natural gas and substituting natural gas for coal. Uh, the emissions are uh, significantly reduced, 50 to 60% if you switch from a coal plant to a natural gas plant. Um, in some cases, it can be less expensive. And I think very importantly, natural gas is also very enabling to, um, to the introduction of more and more rene renewables on the grid. So if you look at what's happening in California, we actually have a huge amount of solar during the middle of the daytime. And what happens at nighttime, you know, the sun goes down and that's just when the demand is really terrific, you know, the, the biggest demand of the day. So what happens, they ramp up the natural gas plant. So I see them as very enabling and it's not just a California story. If you look at Ireland, for example, they have a huge amount of wind power and a lot of it is because they can balance it with natural gas. So I think that's what you do in the short term. Um, so then, so what do you do next, okay? So I think what, what you do next is you seriously think about uh, CCS, CO, CO2 capture and storage. And the way I like to think about it. Just explain really briefly, what, what is that technology? Okay. So basically that technology is that uh, instead of letting the carbon dioxide just go into the atmosphere after you burn the fossil fuel, you, you capture that, you, you have a chemical scrubbing method, you compress that, you then pump it uh, deep underground into the kind of formation that uh, you will essentially get per permanent storage. So that's basically the idea. Okay, so now we're on to CCS. So I actually like using CCS with uh, natural gas. I think it was initially introduced as a coal technology. Um, it's actually less expensive to produce electricity if you have natural gas plus CCS as compared to coal plus CCS. Uh, so, so the way I see it is, is you have a, a pipeline that goes to a power plant. Well, why not have another pipeline bringing the carbon dioxide back? And so the oil and gas industry could take it back there's nobody better prepared with the technology and capacity to actually become the sequestration industry. 
The other thing that the, that can be done. Th then the fossil fuel industry. Then the fossil fuel right. industry, absolutely. So then the next thing is is the natural gas. You can also gasify, and and produce hydrogen, and then we can use that hydrogen for heavy duty transportation. And one day I hope Nate's technology works, and there'll be more and more renewably sourced hydrogen. But it will be way easier to introduce that if we already have a robust hydrogen infrastructure, and and that can be gradually ramped up while we're using the hydrogen for these other applications. You crack the natural gas into hydrogen and then use the hydrogen right. in those and ways. Right, use that yeah. for 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 transportation, for commercial purposes, or even for heavy duty industry. So that's what you do in, in the intermediate term. And then if you really look to the long term, um, Arun and and the number, you know, Tom Jaramillo yesterday, you know, laid out this vision that we could have carbon neutral fuels. So we basically take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, we have renewable energy, and we have water, and we have fancy catalysts, and they basically uh, produce fuels. Well, really, what is that? It's a gigantic refinery that makes chemicals and fuels, just like the oil and gas industry operate today. But instead of having a pipeline coming from a well field that, that contains uh, the, the hydrocarbons, in fact, your pipeline is an enormous transmission line coming in together with CO2 uh, and, and water. And so I, I don't think there's a better industry to, to, uh, to take on that challenge either. So I, my view is, is that if we have a strong and really well-prepared oil and gas industry, that they can be enabling at every step on the way. I just want to add one more point. If you, I really, it's extraordinary what's happened in the United States. We had peak emissions in 2007. We are now down around 10%. Why is that? Well, in part renewables, but really the big story is the switch from coal to gas. We used to get 50% of our electricity from gas. Now it's something like 35% because we've ramped up the gas. So it's really had a measurable, I mean, what, how many countries can say they've actually cut their emissions by, uh, by, by 10%? And it's really the positive story about natural gas. So, Jim, it'll be interesting to hear you throw in about the, the effect of, 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 of efficiency on that as well. But thank you. Let's, um, um, Bert, let, so nuclear now is about 11% of electricity generation globally. And um, there are really well-publicized efforts around the world to, of, of countries to back off from nuclear. Uh, France or uh, well, Germany. You've Germany. got the numbers just backwards. Okay. The world is not backing off from nuclear. The world is moving toward nuclear. So I want to remind people that this is an important week, not just because of this meeting, but this is the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's transmission of 95 theses to the Archbishop of Mainz. And that changed the whole world. Now, I have 10 theses, and I want to change the way people think about nuclear power. <laughs> Okay, the first is that the International Energy Agency now projects that nuclear worldwide will expand by between a factor of two and three between now and 2040. It does not matter what the U.S. does. The main growth is going to be in Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and South America. The lead in the design of all the next generation nuclear reactors that don't use water is with China, India, and Russia, not with us. In the US, the states that do what California does are very unlikely to reach their California's 2050 goals. California's goals are emissions of 20% of 1990 by 2050. Uh, California asked the California Council of Science and Technology to review the California program, and they did, and the report is there, and it's on their website, and it says, you cannot do it with California's definition of nuclears alone. And, and remind us what California just has done. California, well, let me remind you first what California's definition of renewables is. It excludes big hydro, and it excludes nuclear. California has also got a new goal, which is called 50 by 30, 50% 50 renewables by 2030. And uh, uh, it's not going to reach that goal either, I will bet you. Uh, one of the things somebody said was to talk about the uh, stability of the grid when you get too much nuclear. You can look at both Germany and Spain both Germany and Spain, when 15% of 
of their electricity came from wind and solar, started having trouble with the stability of the grid, uh, started having to eliminate some of the subsidies for wind and solar, and started having to raise electricity prices, which now are almost the highest in Europe. Um, if you want to look at the 50 by 30 goal, you only need to look at New York, because New York reached 50 in 15, in 2015. New York includes big hydro and nuclear, and nu New York gets well over 50% of its clean energy today, and it doesn't have to talk about what we're doing in the future, because it includes both big hydro and nuclear. On the problems people talk about with nuclear, there are no technical problems in disposing of spent fuel. There are only political problems. And the US had better think about the strategic issues having to do with nuclear. US has been extremely influential in the world in regulations and in systems to limit the spread of nuclear weapons. If we are not playing in the game of nuclear, we are not going to have any influence on limiting the spread of weapons-ready technology. And we ought to think about that as well as the question. I'm going to so, give you 30, 30 more seconds, and then we'll come back to nuclear in the, in, in the greater discussion. Go uh, thir I don't need 30 don't more need 30 seconds. seconds. I've given you 10 theses. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm going to change the opinion of everybody out there who's anti-nuclear to become pro-nuclear from it. Okay, thank you. And right. you can catch up, too. Sorry? I'll pass on my 30 yeah. seconds. Excellent. Thank Jim Sawyer is <laughs> seeds his yeah, time, the gentleman man. does. Okay, so to, just to frame this, we've had a long discussion about renewals. We've had a long discussion about different sources of, 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 of energy. And now let's talk a bit about the use of it. Yeah. I think the important thing about the use of energy, um, which I'll talk about energy efficient, is economically uh, efficient reductions of energy use. It's really different than conversations about wind or solar or nuclear, because those are each about one class of, of technologies. Energy efficiency is about the whole, whole economy works, the whole US economy or the whole world economy. OK, I won't hit you. <laughs> um, and about, you know, I grew up talking with my hands, I still do, so you gotta just watch out. Um, <laughs> and, and what has happened in the US is really, we weren't paying any attention to energy efficiency until 1973 when we had the oil crisis. It was a shot across the bow. And then every consuming sector of the economy started doing things differently. Uh, finding ways to reduce the use of energy while still uh, producing the outputs that they did or consuming uh, the goods and services that they wanted in households, keeping their homes warm and their refrigerator and their beer cold. Uh, um, all of those continued happening. And it was a combination of not one thing, but a very interesting mix of a lot of things working together. Uh, I may, if we have time, I may go back to what I mean by that. But the net result is that uh, in 1973, there was an inflection point in the growth curves of energy in each one of those sectors. So in the aggregate, we started before the 1973, energy use was growing, was growing along with the economy minus about a half a percent a year. Once the oil prices increased, and we had a lot of policy innovation, and the private sector started innovating differently, and consumers started recognizing energy was a problem, that rate of change was moved from a half of a percent decline a year to 2.7%. Until oil prices dropped in 1973. And then then the government backed off from almost any new policy programs, but the private sector didn't. The private sector kept innovating in, in throughout the economy in the use of energy so that on net, the ratio of energy to, to the economy 
has been declining about 1.7% a year, almost every year since 1985. It's been a very steady, um, maybe boring change, but 1.7% a year going on steadily has been what has decarbonized the U.S. economy. Since 1973, carbon per dollar of GDP has declined 61%. It's now 29, uh, 39% of what it was before. Of that 61%, about 57% is more efficient use of energy. About 4% is, is cleaning up the energy system. So 57 using less energy per dollar of GDP. 4% cleaning up the energy system. That's the role of wind and solar and geothermal and nuclear and fracking for natural gas all, and hydropower all put together. Half, to Bird's point, half of that, that progress has been nuclear power. So all the rest is about half of 1%. You can go decade by decade, and it's been true that every decade we've, we've been having recently this 1.7%. So it's a very slow change. It was stated that we have a decoupling from uh, between the economy and the energy use. Wrong. They're completely, they're completely coupled. As you see, when the economy goes down, energy use goes down. When economy goes up, energy use goes up. But the steady rate of about 1.7% a year is decarbonizing the economy, and it's because it's happening to hundreds of thousands of, of companies and people making, making those small changes. So what about the future? Well, when you look at how, how all of those things happen, you'll see there's a combination of policies, expectations of, of corporations and individuals, um, regulations that are defined to be cost effective, uh, and change attitudes. I'm very concerned about this election. If we move to a point in which we had um, a leadership that says we don't care about climate change or energy, and there's a, everybody's expectations change, you're going to start seeing changes throughout the whole economy. It's not what the government does, it was what everybody through the economy does. And if we have this bully pulpit leadership that says energy and environment's important, and we're going to continue to doing things like adding a, a revenue neutral carbon tax, which we really need to get to have a view, to have an incentive across the whole economy changing the use of energy, then we're going to see the continuing process that we're seeing right now of companies developing more energy efficient motors, um, better insulation on the refrigerators, um, transition towards electric vehicles and, and, and others, uh, yield management in airlines getting even better, which has been a major uh, reason why we reduce the use of energy there. Making you even so more right now, politically, it matters what we do yeah, to the energy future partly because of what the government does, but mostly because of what the expectations will be set up for the whole rest of the economy. Okay, so Jim, I, I want to ask you a quick thing, and then, and then Bert and Sally, I want to ask you something about what you said. So Jim, are you, there was this statistic from the federal government, as I said before, that uh, gasoline use reached new levels uh, earlier in June um, as gas prices declined. Um, and at the same time, Vehicles have gotten more efficient, uh, as you say, partially, at least partially, due to uh, federal rules. So if, as the steady march of energy efficiency continues, given where prices are, does, how, 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 how far does energy efficiency get us toward actually reducing emissions? Well, we've been doing that 1.7% a year almost every year, about 15 years ago, when I was thinking about this, I said, you know, we've run out of all of the options. You know, all the elasticity is just all gone from this system. It's just not going to happen. Yet it keeps happening on and on. And it keeps happening with technology innovations, most of which neither I nor my friends who deal with energy efficiency saw coming. 
Right, but my, I think that's going to keep happening. But, I think it's going to keep happening with new technologies over and over. And I <laughs> expect that 1.7%, give or take a couple percentage points to continue, unless we have a, a, a political leadership that says it's not important, and then it's going to reduce. Okay. Okay, thanks. So Bert and Sally, we just heard for a half an hour before the three of you came up here a discussion about a new architecture of the energy system, or at least of the electricity system, a redesigned grid to allow distributed resources in a big way that would essentially revolutionize the system. Now, both of you, I, I don't want to be so simplistic as to cast this as an either or, but both of you are talking about the need for a continuation of effectively centralized sources of electricity. Um, so I just talk through how you view this notion of a, a new grid to facilitate a kind of flowering of, distri of, of distributed sources. How big a deal is that or is that not, given what you've just said about fossil fuels and about nuclear? Yeah. I mean, if we really look at the enormous progress, you know, the California story of having 10 and a half gigawatts of so solar, that's utility scale solar, right? That is not distributed generation. Those are large, they're basically gigantic power plants out in the desert. And, from uh, many perspectives, they're not really any different than having a gas plant, you know. It, I, Rather than solar you know, panels on your right. house. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, putting solar pan panels on your house, I think there's some places where the electric grid is quite weak and that the distribution system isn't robust enough and, and you really need to do that. It has huge benefits. Even putting storage in the distribution system may make a, a tremendous amount of sense. On the other hand, it's fairly well known that utility scale solar is cheaper than distributed solar. So you need to look at the full system and decide where are those regions where it really makes sense to put the to distributed generation and where is it more economically sensible to put uh, you know, a larger scale facilities. But you know, people are gonna choose and I think that people want the, the, the option to choose and if they choose to put you know, PV and storage on their house and if they wanna go off the grid, I think, you know, hallelujah, you know, to, that, to be, they can to, do to, that too. To, to so. be clear, even if, if utility scale solar continues to expand, that itself requires a changing in the grid, right? It's not just mm -hmm. rooftop solar that would require that because of the intermittency of solar. Right, right, which, you know, sort of, so I think, I mean, the way I see it is, is that the developed world has a fossil fuel back, backbone. Um, initially, we started adding renewables. There was, you know, uh, fear and, 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 and uncertainty. Could we accommodate that? I think that we've learned to accommodate more and more renewables. I think, you know, that, that's really been extraordinary, um, uh, that, that progress. And, and, and like I said, I think natural gas has been really enabling to that. Hydro is also enabling to that. Uh, you know, large-scale hydro, pumped hydro is hugely enabling to that. So I don't really see them as incompatible, but, but you know, it's, and I'm not sure when we can wean ourselves of a fossil fuel backbone. I, you know, I think until, you know, Nate's technology and, and these zero-carbon fossil fuels uh, come along, or zero-carbon, um, zero-carbon, um, hydrocarbon fuels come along, it's going to be hard to, we're not going to tolerate a day without power you know, we're, yeah, we're just not gonna do it. So I don't know when that transition will come. And, and if we are going to be using fossil fuels, we sure as heck shouldn't allow us to emit CO2 into the atmosphere when we do it, which is you know, why CC at carbon capture and storage is an important part of a portfolio. So I wanna come back to that in a second, but Bert, Sally just talked about the well, world's, I, uh, can I just, let, me just, let me just frame a question here, that Sally talked about the world's ability to deal with large scale renewables, and you just said that countries are facing problems at 15% penetration, so. so yes. They are, and the reason is that there's no decent storage. Arun wants to fix this problem by putting in transmission from regions where there's strong wind to our region, for example, when the wind stops broken. So that says I need to bring it from the Great Plains or the Great Lakes. That's where the big strong winds are. Now, if I'm going to get 50% of my electricity from things like wind, I've got to bring 30 gigawatts of wind-generated electricity here when the wind stops blowing. That is not distributed generation. That is centralized, but it's the whole center of the country. If you talk to Mark Jacobson and pin him down, he will tell you that wind is very correlated over large areas. If it's not blowing at Tehachapi, it's not blowing at Altamont. 
If it's not blowing one place in the Great Plains, it's not blowing most of the place in the Great Plains. So the scale of things you're talking about, uh, I think people are misleading themselves when they're talking about distributed. The nuclear guys are talking about small modular reactors. Let's go down from the gigawatt ones to the 100 megawatt ones. Yeah, I can plant 100 megawatt ones. Uh, but if I look at the latest big solar thermal plant, the Avampa plant, I think it's 400 megawatts. And they did that to try and make it Capacity. Cheap. Yeah. Not, not actual production, to be clear. That's right. right. But they did it to try and make it cheap. And in fact, if you look at the power purchase agreement, they're buying the power for about three or four times as much as the cost of electricity from Diablo Canyon. The system in California is irrational. The system in other parts of the country is not quite so irrational. The thing is to get clean electricity, and I want to make one more comment about the world. Uh, one of our big problems is the world and its growing population. And if you ask me what the biggest contribution to decarbonization is, it's to make free, long-term contraceptives available to every woman who wants it without any questions asked, and without her husband having to give permission. You got IUDs, which are essentially as long as you want. You got implants, which are three or four years. We are expecting 10 billion people in 2050. We had 7 billion in 2000. We're expecting 11 and a half billion in 2100. And all of these developing countries are trying to see their GDPs per capita go up, and that requires more energy, or it may require less capita. And so I wish people would take a look at the real story around the world. We in California are setting a horrible example for the rest of the world. New York is setting a much better example. I've told you they have already passed California's 2030 yeah, you goal. Know, I, but, you know, I, to say California is a horrible example, it I is. think that's, I mean, I agree it's not perfect. We have a patchwork quilt of a strategy, but if you talk to the people who've made those policies, they tell you this is what we could do at that moment in time, and we, pri we prioritize decarbonization over having a perfectly elegant policy. I mean, I, I think the California story is extraordinary. I, I agree that, that shutting down our nuclear plants is, is going to probably cause our emissions to be higher than they otherwise would have been. Uh, going forward, and we're going to have to work extra hard to deal with that. But I, I think it's really unfair to say that California is a horrible example. Well, well you want to weigh on I, this, Jim? I, I, just, it's useful sometimes to have numbers. I, I actually think California is a pretty good example, but they pat themselves on the back too hard. Um, <laughs> for example, if you look, look since 19, AB 32 has passed, which said we're going to do a lot of innovative things, and some of those have passed on the rest of the country. The percentage by which we've reduced carbon emissions between then and 2014, when we had the last final inventory, is slightly slower than the average of the United States, the right. rate, rate at which it was reduced. Now, the difference is that California economy grows faster than the US, and that that compensates for it, but this, this broad patting on the back because we're the ones that are reducing carbon dioxide, sometimes it's useful to look at the numbers to see that we're actually reducing carbon dioxide a little slower than the rest of the United States. And what is, what is a, for any of you, what, what is a politically realistic antidote to that fact in California? Look, New York had a politically realized, uh, realistic antidote by including nuclear in the subsidy system. Nobody here has said one word about the real cost of the renewables. The fact that there are subsidies are hidden. The subsidies on wind, the production tax credit, is roughly two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. 
the cost to the grid people of integrating this variable thing is another two and a half to three cents. Right. So a just to be clear, that three cent figure in Dubai did not include the cost of transmission. That was the cost of generation. This is what yeah, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think there's a lot we can do in the United States. I agree with whoever said a carbon tax is very important. And the revenue neutral carbon tax may in fact be sellable to the Republicans on the grounds of revenue neutrality. You'll never sell it to the Republicans on the grounds that we're gonna take the money and we're gonna spend it on something, but you might sell it on that. And besides the nuclear world, I'm actually working on that with the Hoover Institution people. I'm quite broad in my, uh, my political one, position. One quick question in and, and it, in less than a minute, and then we're going to bring the other three up and we're going to have you get involved and ask some questions. So perhaps this is an inaccurate perception, but my impression is that there is a lot less momentum behind carbon capture and storage than there was five or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the data points on that very quickly are that there have been a couple of very high profile plants that have gone south. Mm -hmm. um, What's going on? Is this is is it realistic? Right. Yeah. So so if you look back to the to the late '90s, there was a rush of enthusiasm for carbon capture and storage. Uh, four projects came online relatively quickly, uh, with with one exception. They were actually you know great successes and you know have gone very well. Uh, expectations were right had risen that that was just going to continue um, in fact it didn't for a whole number of reasons including uncertainty whether there would actually ever be a price on carbon uh, I would say the real doldrums were in the period of like 2010 to 2013 or so but actually I'm seeing a lot of interest picking up again and in fact if you look up between 2015 and 2020 we are doubling the total amount of CCS that's happening through large-scale projects happening around the world bigger projects than ever before uh, and in fact uh, the latest one that came online was a quest project where there it's a, a gasification facility and they're taking the the, the co2 um, from the gasification and pumping that and is that really quickly is is that because because of a political change that is an increasing expectation of a price on carbon that makes this economic or is that because the technology advanced mm -hmm. to a point where the where the economic demand uh, the, the sort of the bar mm -hmm. is, is is more yeah optimistic. so far the projects we've seen have been kind of the patchwork quilt so if you look at the gorgon project in in australia which is a very large co2 capture and storage project basically the government said you can't develop this offshore gas lease unless you unless you use ccs in the case of uh, the Quest project, uh, it, the, the hydrogen is actually used for, up, is for upgrading uh, oil sands. Um, there are, we have a, a low carbon fuel standard in California, which would make it impossible for us to buy, uh, or very expensive to buy crude from, from Canada, for example. So having this uh, CO2 storage helped offset the emission intensity of that. So, so this is policy. Right, yeah, they're all then policy driven, but not a, not a blanket policy such as could be achieved through a carbon tax. Okay. Can I okay. ask her something yeah. about CCS? Why don't you come on up while, while, while Bert's talking? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the things I found very interesting is the notion of using uh, natural gas fuel cells mm -hmm. because that uses the hydrogen in the natural gas mm -hmm. and the only products are CO2 and water vapor mm -hmm. and the most expensive part of CCS is separating and capturing the CO2. Mm -hmm. So is it possible that uh, by going to the methane fuel cell, mm -hmm. you're gonna reduce the cost of CCS so much as to make it more attractive? Well, th that, what you said is absolutely true if you have pure oxygen um, in the fuel cell, but if you're using air in the fuel cell, you still no, have CO2 and CO2. nitrogen. There mobile. are new technologies where you can use different right. types of, of fuel cells that will somewhere. actually allow you to separate the CO2 and generate power in the, in the process mm -hmm. of doing that. So there's lots of exciting things coming along. Well, I okay. could, Actually, the way pull the, out your phones while Jim's talking. Real yeah, quick. I mean, the, think of a company like a, a little local company, Bloom Energy. They they do a steam reforming of the natural gas uh, in in the facility, and then use the use the hydrogen. They have almost a pure stream of, of carbon dioxide and 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 water. 
that's almost free to capture. Not that's, nothing really yeah. actually free, but that's almost free. You're going to need a, a, a you need a pipeline to bring the natural gas in, but you also need a pipe to bring the carbon dioxide out to a gathering station. But so I don't see why you couldn't have carbon capture and storage through fuel cells like Bloom, with a central. Uh, uh, use of natural gas in a way that greatly reduces the carbon dioxide emissions. Not to zero, but greatly from So I would suggest that an interesting question for someone in the audience to ask might be, would Nancy invest in what's just been articulated? But we will not ask that question right now. <laughs> um, so pull, pull out, pull out your phones. take that offline. Pull out your phones, and here's the first question. And then we're going to let you guys weigh in with, with your questions. So I guess the slide's going to come up. If you had $10 billion to invest over the next, next decade in moving the energy system toward one that emits, again, no net carbon. That is, at the end of the day, any carbon that it emits is offset entirely by, by carbon that it sucks in, in a sink. Would you invest in panel A or panel B? Would you invest in the disruptors or in the evolutionists, as we might call them? Or would you split the difference? So this is basically who wins. And the availability of the investments. Okay. Totally different. Do we have an answer? Are we still getting results? Yeah, we're still getting results. Okay. But I don't think the results are going to change. Well, we'll see. Interesting. Are people changing their votes? Only, <laughs> only within the noise. Okay. So this is a disruptive audience, but interesting equally in both. Okay. All right. Great. Next question. You want to say any, anyone want to say anything about that? No. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think it's, yeah. it's it makes sense. It's, it's, a, it's the same. Yeah. Right. It, it depends All right. who you are. You you didn't say who are you acting as when you're an investor. If you're a government, you might well have a different answer and your risk profile than if you're a utility. Than if you're a VC. I I think that's kind of an unfair question because it wasn't framed as to. What risk profile and who you know, are you? I get that a lot. It's an unfair question. It was unfair. Question. Oh, it's sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it's not rigged. It was just okay. unfair. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Last one. Following this discussion, has your level of confidence that we can transform our global energy system into one that emits no net carbon increased or decreased or not changed? Do you walk out of here happier or sadder or about the same? <laughs> And then the first, and tee up a couple of questions. While we're thinking, someone raise your hand. Who wants to ask a question? Gentleman right here in the front, right in the front. Uh, go ahead and ask your question, and then we'll, we'll wait for this to tally. Well, actually, I guess it's tallying. Right. So, well, you, you've all been fairly unpersuasive, I'm sorry to say. That's right. <laughs> no, 40% changed. But 20% effectively in either way. Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> okay. So 40% changed. <laughs> all right. Most people, most people haven't changed at all. Sir, please. So there was a couple of people that said the sun doesn't always shine. And I did a little history. And I recall there was a guy in 1543 that published a document that said that the sun is always up. It just depends on where you are. So there was also a woman in the early 1800s named Elizabeth Hayrick. And she, living in England, uh, published a little pamphlet that said that we got to get off of slavery. There's no time to wait. And it must be done while all the time, it, at that time, people were arguing that we just had to start gradually. Let's just stop exporting or you know, transferring uh, people from Africa over to the, to the New World and so forth. Um, so my question is, given that we understand how serious our problem is, how is it that we can possibly consider continuing to use fossil fuels? Is there a plan for drastic, immediate getting rid of this crazy way we're living? Okay, Sally, you want to take that one on first? No. 
Well, no I, plan I, or no. What's the two-word answer yeah. rather than the one-word? Uh, you well. know, I, I don't think there's something we can do tomorrow that ten years from now would have us. Uh, I, I don't think we could say, well, we're going to ban fossil fuels tomorrow, and ten years from now it would accom be accomplished. Maybe we could do it in Palo Alto or, or maybe California, but there are many places around the world where getting more access to energy is the most important thing can, they can do to to improve their economies and improve the lives of the people who live in those countries. So, well, I that's just, that's good news because when you look at Africa and the developing world, they skipped the landline generation with phones, and many of those regions mm -hmm. will skip the centralized grid. And, and what you're seeing in terms of investment trends is a move directly from zero electricity or worse, uh, kerosene to solar and storage and efficient appliances. TV Give us just but, one but, example but, but of where I, that's I, happening I on X scale. I want to say that. I mean, I agree that that's happening. But but that is not building the industrial foundations of those countries. Well, it's, it's, this is distributed it's, in it's village. A it's, it's, it's a start. It's a start. And, 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 and the wonderful. grid in Nigeria, have you ever seen it? it, it it's a completely dysfunctional grid. So mm -hmm. there's even where there is a grid in, in, in many parts of Africa, you don't get power many, many hours a day. So to say that it's not industrial, there is no industry there. It's the start. It's a path. It will be joined with uh, distributed clean grids. And the, the people that are putting the money in are not you know, little VCs like myself. These are the major uh, European energy and oil companies, development banks, um, uh, Private equity firms. This is this is not marginal. This, no, no, this is I, what we're no, doing, I, I, and, and it I, will I, lift people out of poverty. It will. It will be better. It will be much better. I'm. A, I'm. That's my. I have a big research project exactly on those issues, but I don't think it's going to be enough. I, I, well, I simply uh, why don't, don't think we all just enough. like go home and, and I mean this is the most negative panel I've been on in a long time. <laughs> I have to say, and I'm a Stanford graduate, and I'm I'm kind of embarrassed. This, this, this. It we can do this to compare a hundred year old technology to new renewables, and and the, and to say Ivanpah isn't as effective as a nuclear plant. Well, I think there's been sixty or seventy years of nuclear. Have there ever been any accidents in nuclear plants? I don't know. Maybe Maybe, is there a history major in the room? The, the, you're, you're, you need to compare apples and apples. And it's silly. It's really unrigorous to compare a hundred year old technology with renewables who have been around for, which have been around for about a decade. That's not what you get an A on when you're at Stanford. Can I make a comment? Okay. You, now, now yeah. yeah. Each of you may make one comment. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that I agree with a great deal of what you said. The fact that the developing world doesn't have to repeat our efforts, our errors, and get hooked on coal and that sort of thing is absolutely terrific. I was talking about what's going on in the developed world. And I completely agree with you about the developing world. The small solar things that will charge cell phones and run a TV set in the schools are doing remarkable things uh, for agriculture in Africa, for education all over the world. We have a system in this country which is different from a lot of others. We are not centrally directed. The only thing we do centrally is we can dangle incentives in front of the private sector. And one of the most important questions is what incentives we should be dangling before the private sector to get them to choose the best technology right. to solve the problem. And that, I'm sorry to say, I may disagree with you here, hiding the subsidies doesn't give the signal to the private sector. I feel much more comfortable if the subsidies were written down. You don't have to cancel them. What are they? What are we doing? Why did we want to shut down a working nuclear power plant, which is only going to run our emissions up? And okay. we have now the county that it's in saying, what's going to happen to us? We're losing all these jobs. Who's going to compensate us? They want PG&E to compensate that's, them? Ridiculous. No, you know, so that's, it, that's it, not it happening. To, it seems to me we're talking in one-dimensional thinking, carbon dioxide. 
if you to think about the energy area, there's two other dimensions. It's got to be the economy. Will the economy work? Do we have security of all of the things that we want? Mm -hmm. If we were to give up on the fossil fuels, we would give up on both the economy and security very quickly. Maybe it, in over time, yes, we're going to make adjustments as we go in greater, greater and greater fraction as cleaner energies. But if we want to focus on just one dimension, I think conversations go off the rails that way. But maybe we should have a meeting about it, and I hope people don't have to drive or fly to that meeting. <laughs> All right. Since, since, since four yeah. of you would wait in, you two weigh in really quickly, and then other people should get to ask a question. Nate, you were shaking your head harder. Two points. Um, one, let's look at Rwanda. Um, it's really great that they're <coughs> leapfrogging the fossil energy and we're putting in through the World Bank wind and solar and microgrids. It's probably not really great that we're charging the poorest people in the, in the um, planet over 20 cents a kilowatt hour to get that electricity because that's what it costs them in real dollars, boots on the ground, to install these very expensive installations even that it's unreliable now. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it more and that we have to learn down but there are two sides to this issue. The, the second one is that uh, it's one thing to talk about the price of on the margin power. It's another thing to talk the price of power that's 99.99% reliable. And I think we need to be really clear about how much we value reliability, about how much we value energy services, and it's one thing to make um, an investment on the margin that you can make money in one scenario. It's another thing to do it in a way that sees you through to a high reliability that we all value so our data centers, so our aircraft, so our lights stay on whenever we want them. And I think we just need to be clear about how much we value the energy services that we get uh, so that we can actually go toward a system that delivers what people expect when they expect to Are get you it. Are in on this? Yeah, let me just back up and I was just listening to this right. with interest. Um, I think we have the problem of developing economies and the problem of the developed world are very different. Right. And um, I think we need to, and there are multiple factors that come in. Economic growth uh, is a key factor when you're talking about developing uh, economies and access to energy affordable energy is absolutely key. And luckily, the decarbonized solution happens to be the way to go out there. And so they can, as uh, as Bert uh, just pointed out, you can leapfrog. You don't have to go to the coal, oil, gas sort of route that the rest of the world, that we in the developed world have taken. We, on the electricity side, frankly. But let me just, let me just I just want to, at some point, address Sally's question that, yeah. that the notion of effectively leapfrogging and, and the world in a massive way going quickly off fossil fuels is simply unrealistic. Yeah. How, I, so are, let how me, are they going to drive point, around in, in India yeah, and so, Pakistan right. and, and so Africa? That's how a, are they going to drive yeah. around? Yeah. So we haven't talked about transportation. Right. And for the electricity sector, and if you, let's say you put a carbon price, let's say you put $20, $30 at it's, it makes very little difference on the transportation side. And we haven't really talked about transportation. And I think what we are underestimating is the, the cost curve that is coming down in the batteries that, uh, that E was talking about and the impact that will have on the electrification of transportation. And this is, you know, we, we love to have Teslas. It's a beautiful product. It has changed the way people think about it. It has raised the bar for the electricity, for the transportation industry. But I'm talking about transportation growth mostly in developing economies. And there, I think that's where the big impact could be in electrifying transportation as long as you decarbonize the grid, which, as we just talked about, we have more options. For the transportation side, right now, if you don't have oil, you're done. You're right. stuck. So getting off fossil fuel right away it's a very bad idea. You're going to be stuck. And Literally. so I, I, we, have to, we have to be careful about how we pose this. Unless the price of electric vehicles comes down to about $15,000 a car, I hope you guys make that in Tesla, that can drive 300, 400 miles, 
well, that'll be great, but we don't have, we're not there yet. Right, well, and, right. and there we're really isn't the, first, the, you know, I agree. the first 10 that, years. That's right. And, and there are other car manufacturers that, have, that are now that's getting right. involved. Yeah. And innovation doesn't happen with one company. It, it, it happens when one company influences the incumbent exactly. sector, which exactly. is what we're seeing. So it takes time. So I think, we need, you know, the question was, can we get off fossil fuel right away? I don't think so. I think we'll be, we'll be stuck. Economy will, will, will come to a halt if you get off fossil fuel right away. Okay, one, I don't know, I don't I, know if that's I, what you asked. This was, yeah, uh, wait, I actually, is there, there are students in the room, and I'm going to use executive privilege, and a student gets the next question if there's a student who wants Perfect. to ask a question. And you're Perfect. Stanford students, so you better ask a question. Optimistic <laughs> question. Come on, no one uh, wants to raise your hand? Give me a break. Really? students only get answers. <laughs> Excellent. Really? There's no oh, there, there's no there are student students there back over there. Yeah. Okay. Way Excellent. In the back. Well done. Thanks. Brave students. <laughs> well, I know what Dormy lives in. Go ahead. I'm interested in knowing what the most uh, that what carbon storage solutions have the highest potential in terms of. I heard hydro plant pumps mentioned, but what can be created that will have the highest potential in terms of high density? Uh, storage to get us um, oh. over the hump so that we can have renewable energy across the system. Well, you're, you're seeing a lot of developments in, 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 in those that you just mentioned. I mean, ion lithium has improvements. Flow batteries are now coming onto the scene for longer discharge charge cycles. Uh, a lot of utilities like those better than having to replace ion lithium uh, packs all the time. But I think there's going to be a flow proliferation of, yeah. of approaches, and mm -hmm. that's, that's all good, because that'll drive the cost down to all right. well, be affordable. Physics, I, I'm kind of going to be the physicist engineer here. 55,000 gallons of water pumped up Hoover Dam is the energy in one gallon of gasoline. Energy <laughs> density matters. Uh, flow batteries, 20 watt hours in a liter. Lithium ion batteries, 200 watt hours in a liter. Gasoline, 12,000 watt hours in a liter. Energy density matters. So I'll say in the end, the best way to store energy is the nucleus of an atom and then in chemical bonds. And ultimately, that's where all energy is stored now. It's stored in the energy of chemical bonds. And I think that our planet in 100 years is going to run on stored energy in chemical bonds. And we just got to figure out a way to get there soon. But I would, uh, let me just add that that is true if you're only doing physics and, yeah, and that's uh, right. <laughs> but, 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 but there's in the energy world, the there's, marketplace, there's an economics, <laughs> there's economics. And no I one think listens to you in, unless you got that. So. The economics are very important. Cost and scale is everything yeah. in energy. And I think in this, in the storage world, lithium ion batteries is the elephant in the room. And other battery technologies that are going to be developed will have to compete with that. And that is going down in a cost curve that he talked about. And that's what is the dominant. It's like silicon in semiconductor devices. A lot of other semiconductors are there. They're faster, better. You got to beat that silicon. And yeah, it's very hard but, to do but that. But the reality is, is the big storage we do today is pumped hydro. Right. And we have, we can deliver a thousand gigawatts. That I was mean, my, getting a thousand yeah. gig, okay, you can finish that. No, that was my first yeah. comment is the, the cheapest way to store is pumped hydro. You take today's hy hydroelectric dams, a small fraction of them are retrofitted to do pumped hydro. We should be retrofitting all of them, whichever ones we can. That's the cheapest way. Right. After that, you got to have storage. Yeah. Right, and it's not enough, and it will never be enough yeah. because we don't have enough places to do pumped hydro. So, so right now, that's very helpful for integration of renewables, but it won't take us there. We need other choices. And for transportation, I don't think any other, that's the 800-pound gorilla in the room is that is the lithium ion battery. So well, that and, is, and that in is your the conference last week, the, the former president of uh, PJM, he said, I want some lithium ion, but I don't like it all the time. I want flow batteries. I want this. I want yeah. that. He's the one that's buying, not, a, not us on this podium. So that's, you know, that's where you need to look at where are people actually spending money so that you can derive the economies of scale and drive down the cost. But he also add, believes yeah. that they, you don't need very much storage based on the kind of grid they have. In a grid where you don't have much hydro, um, 
like the California grid, we're going to need a lot of storage yeah, right. unless we can have a really tremendous wide area integration, which we may or may not do. We have mostly talked about the electricity sector. I think we have, we will be kidding ourselves right. about decarbonizing the world economy. The most difficult thing is to decarbonize the industry. Right. Process heat is one of the most difficult things to decarbonize. Transportation is difficult to decarbonize. And I think it's easy, we have at least have options of nuclear renewables on the electricity side. If you only do that and not worry about the others, we will not solve the right. climate change problem. So perhaps well, we I don't think up. anyone is abandoning. I mean, we have in our, we have in this, in Palo Alto, we have Tesla Motors that has pioneered electric drive, uh, electric cars and, and is driving down the cost and is inspiring a whole new generation of students probably in this room to, to make share. it better. I agree with you. So yeah. I don't think anyone's ignoring transportation. I think we all realize, and combined with autonomous drive and, and and driving, uh, owning cars as a service instead of as an asset, that is all incredibly rich in terms of not just the quality of life and, and the, con the offerings to consumers, but the impact on climate. So, I think I mean, we're I think in violent know, agreement. And we had GM here yesterday, you know, describing a very exciting vision, and they have a bolt that for $30,000, you can get an electric car that drives yeah. 240 miles. That is amazing. That's so exciting. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're all in violent agreement. <laughs> Not that violent, right? I don't know. This has been a pretty fun discussion, it seems to me. Um, so the red light's blinking, which means we're way over time. Um, thank you all very, very much. Thank you for not just being here, but for really being real. Um, thank you for...